Hey guys, we're back for volume 5, the plasma membrane and diffusion. I hope I can walk you through that. We just finished up organelles uh, not too long ago. Uh, the cell boundaries. First of all, all cells are surrounded by some type of membrane and all cells have a cell membrane no matter what type of cell they are, plant, animal, doesn't matter. Um, some cells are also surrounded by a second boundary which is called the cell wall. And we usually link it with plant cells, but there are other cells out there that have cell walls. Um, both of these serve as a boundary between the cells' insides and its external environment. And the cell membrane is what we call semi or selectively permeable. Um, means it allows some things in and some things out. And you can see when this would be useful. I mean, if I had food inside and there was food outside and I still wanted to get more food in, uh, it would allow food to come in, but it wouldn't allow food to leave. Uh, it would allow waste to leave, but it wouldn't allow waste to come in. So it becomes selectively permeable. Uh, now, when we talk about the plasma membrane, it has two main functions. The first function controls what enters and leaves. And basically, when we talk about controls what enters and leaves, we're saying that it maintains the cell's homeostasis. Now, I hope you remember what that means. That means to maintain a balance is what homeostasis means. So the cell membrane or plasma membrane is responsible for maintaining this balance within a cell, whatever it is, water, food, nutrients, osmotic pressure, whatever it is. And the cell maintains this with its selective permeability. The second function of the plasma membrane is to protect the cell. It protects the inside. Now this is the cell wall's main function because it's a little bit more sturdy, more uh, rigid than the plasma membrane. Now, when we talk about the plasma membrane, I put PM for short. Plasma membrane is made up of a bilayer of phospholipids. I hope you know that means two layers. Um, there are two ends of a phospholipid. Now, the phospholipid, there's a picture over here on the left-hand side. The phospholipid, as you can tell, the phospholipid has a head, and it has what we call a tail. Now, if I were to draw this for you, I would draw it like this, a head, and I'd put a straight leg and a crooked leg. And the reason is this. Um, the two ends of the phospholipid, the head region and the tail region, the tail region can be one of two types. It can be saturated or unsaturated. Now, the saturated is represented by the straight leg, and the unsaturated is represented by the crooked leg. So I would draw it like this. Now, let's look at a couple of terms here. First thing we got to look at is that the head is hydrophilic. Now hydrophilic means exactly, you might not know what that means I guess, but hydrophilic, hydro means water, philic means loving, so the head loves water. The tail is hydrophobic, which means water fearing, so it fears water. Now so think about it, if I have water here, and I took a phospholipid and I threw it into water, it would orient itself like this. The head would go toward the water and the legs would go up. If I threw another one and another one and another one and so on and so forth, they would stick their legs up in the air and their heads would be against the water. Okay? Against the water down here. So, if you think about a plasma membrane, the bilayer of a plasma membrane, really it would end up looking like this. On the outside, you have a row of phospholipids because the, mainly the outside of the cell is water. And then you'd have a row on the inside of phospholipids because you're mostly water on the inside. And this creates the two layers or the phospholipid layer that makes the boundary. So it's kind of neat how it works. Now, let's look a little bit about saturated and unsaturated real quickly. The two types are really easy to understand. The saturated are going to be a stiffer or more rigid um, plasma membrane. The unsaturated are going to be, I'm not sure this is a word, a fluidy um, membrane. So let me explain. If I were to go up here, and I had two saturated phospholipids in my membrane. If I were to push down on this, there's not going to be very much space 
before these legs are going to hit each other. It's going to not give it much flexibility. But now if I take the same phospholipids and make their legs unsaturated, so bend them, there's going to be a lot more space when I push down, and that's going to make it more flexible. So I kind of think of it like this. You know, saturated, you got them hitting together pretty quickly. If you continue to hit them together, hit them together, they're going to break, explode. If unsaturated, if you bend them, they're going to have more room to move, so it's going to make it fluidy, for example. So let's think about it in our body where we won't have this. You would want to have saturated in what type of cells in your body? You'd want to have them in your bone cells. Bone cells, you want them to be stiff or sturdy. Now, where would you want to have fluidy or, or flexible membranes? Skin would be one. Um, blood cells. Sometimes a blood cell this big has to fit through a blood vessel this big, so it has to flex down. And this is really why we have to worry about or think about, you know, um, our cholesterol level. Because the higher the cholesterol, the more st sturdy the membrane is. And if you get too much saturated fats or saturated phospholipids in your membranes of your cells, then they might get clogged. They, they won't be as flexible. They might get clogged up in the cells, and, and it could cause problems. All right, now this is a better picture than what I could draw, but you can now see this is called the fluid mosaic model. It's on page 182 in your book. And you can see they have saturated fats here, but they have these membrane proteins here. These membrane proteins that go through, and they look like they got channels. And that's so something that's over here can go, go through this channel and end up on this side. Um, you know, those membrane proteins are what's going to give the cell its selective permeability. Now, the next thing is random motion of molecules, kind of linked to membranes, diffusion osmosis. We got to tell about a man named Robert Brown who invented what Brownian motion. And he said that molecules, no matter if they're in a gas, a liquid, or a solid, are going to be constantly moving. You know, it's kind of a hard concept. He says that even the, the molecules in your desk are, are static. I mean, they're, I mean not, excuse me, not static. They're continuously moving. Um, they just move so slowly that we can't see it, and it's not going to be detectable to us. Um, you know, one example I can think of, you know, if you go to an old, old house in the woods somewhere uh, that has old-timey glass windows, the bottom of the window might actually be, or the bottom of the glass might actually be thicker than the top because the glass molecules have slid down over time. I mean, that's an example of the molecules moving even though it's uh, concentrated. I mean, excuse me, <laughs> even though it's a solid. Uh, now, when we talk about Brownian motion, the big thing is this. Molecules want to move from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration because of what's called the concentration grid. Now, I like to think of it like this. Many of you know I live up on Potter's Mountain. So if I was on Potter's Mountain up on the top and someone were to give me a push, I would roll all the way down to the bottom of Potter's Mountain and it would require absolutely no energy on my part. And the reason is... I'm going from a high concentration to a low concentration. When you go from high to low, it means you're going down the slope. And slope is just another word for gradient. So if I'm going with the slope, it requires no energy. But now if I was at the bottom of Potter Mountain and someone asked me to roll up the hill, now this is going to require energy because I'm going to have to move from an area of low to high. I'm going to have to move against the slope or go uphill. So, you know, think about it, think about that on the next slide or two. When we talk about diffusion, diffusion is the movement of particles from area of high to low. So it's up on top of Potter's Mountain coming down. Is that going to require any energy? No, absolutely not. Well, osmosis is a form of diffusion. The only key to osmosis is it's dealing with water. Now, so let's think about it. If salt was diffusing, that would be called diffusion of salt. If sodium was diffusing, it would be called diffusion of sodium. If chlorine was diffusion, it'd be called diffusion of chlorine. If water is diffusion, it's called osmosis. I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. Okay, so here's a good diagram of it. If you look, the molecules are more concentrated on the left-hand side than they are on the right. But as they move, they go across the selectively permeable membrane, and they end up until they're equal. As they move, the concentration gradient goes from being very steep to gradually it becomes balanced. And when it becomes balanced, there's no gradient. So then the molecules tend to stop. But they don't completely stop because of what Robert Brown said. 
you know, you got Brownian motion. The molecules are going to still be moving, even though they're in an equilibrium. But if one moves to, to the left, one more is going to move to the right. So they're going to constantly move. Okay. All right. Now, next thing is on page 186. It's talking about three types of solution that you can put a cell in. It deals with osmosis and and diffusion. The first one is an isotonic solution. Now, don't get don't get caught up in the definition. You know, the concentration of both sides of the plasma membrane are equal. Don't worry about that. What you need to be focusing on is no net movement. Well, that's what you need. That's what I'm going to ask you on the test. So basically, it says this: if you have a beaker, pretty beaker in it, and I take a cell, a blood cell, and I throw in, it, and inside the cell, inside the cell, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what it is. Inside the cell is 20% water and 80% salt, NaCl, and in this water in here is 20% water and 80% salt inside the beaker. When you put that cell in there, water's going to be equal on both sides, salt's going to be equal on both sides, there's going to be no net movement. That's called isotonic, okay? Now, what about the next time? What if it wasn't equal? Such as in this case, it says concentration of dissolved substance outside the cell is higher than inside. Water moves out, the cell shrinks. Once again, don't worry about the definition. Concentrate more so on what happens. So let's look at this. Let's go back to my fantastic uh, drawing again. Let's take the same cell. So we've got a cell that's got 20% water, 80% salt, and we're going to throw that cell in here. So throw it into the water. Now in our water this time, listen to what it says. Concentration of dissolved substance outside the cell is higher. The substances that are dissolved in here is sodium or, 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 or salt. So if we got higher inside the water, that means we'd have like 90% water, I mean, excuse me, salt, and we'd have 10% water. So if I threw this cell in here, the chlorine, the, so, the salt, is chlorine is going to want to move into the cell, and water is going to want to move out. Well, as water leaves the cell, the cell gets smaller and smaller. The way I think of it is this, hyper, hyper is going to mean that it's going to shrink. I, I've never seen a 400-pound hyper person. You know, if you ever seen somebody's hyper, they're tiny, they're skinny. So that's how I remember that. All right. The next one is hypotonic. And this is water moves out, the cell swells. The, the concentrations are just reversed. And I think of it this way. The, the hyper is for shrinking, right? I think of hypo, I think hippo. When I think of a hippo, I think of it being big around. So if you threw a red blood cell into a hypotonic solution, Water's going to go into the cell, and it's going to swell, 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 until eventually it bursts, unless it has what's called a contractile vacuum. All right, and here's a picture. So this one would be hypo, this one would be hyper, and this one would be isotonic. So there's your three pictures. All right, now, last thing is two types of transport. Um, there is passive transport. Anytime you see passive, think no energy. You know, if you act, if you passively study for my test, that means you simply put it underneath your head and you hope that the information goes there. So passive, think no energy. Why? Because it goes with the concentration gradient. Think back to my Potter's Mountain example. This would be me on top of the hill rolling down. I'm going with the gradient. It requires no energy on my part. And there's a bunch of different examples. You know, simple diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, or this. So what would happen if I'm at the bottom of Powers Mountain and have to go up? Well, that's active diffusion, or active transport. That's moving against the gradient, going uphill. Does it require energy? Yes. Now, some examples are endocytosis, and there's three different examples of it. Endo means how things come in. Exo means how they leave. And they're going to be going against the gradient, so that means... What if I have a high concentration of food inside my cell, but I still want food to come in? It's going to go from low outside to high inside. It's going to have to go against the gradient uphill, and it's going to require energy. That would be endocytosis. What if I was a cell that lived in a hot lagoon, and I had to get my waste out of my cell? There's a lot more waste around me than inside, but I still need to get the waste out, right? So it's going from low to high. It's going up the hill again. It's going to require energy. That's exocytosis. All right, so I hope... Uh, Video 5 helps you guys. Um, I, I hope that you understand it. If not, we'll definitely go over it. 
and you guys have a good night.